Uh, I must confess, this is Opera Sunday, in case you didn't know. <laughs> and when, when Steve Perry told me that we're going to have an Opera Sunday, I said, well, I am really not an opera fan. And he says, I will convert you. And he has done that. He has done that. These two incredible voices that uh, share our music program are great. But here's a little something about evolution. In the beginning, there was nothing but hydrogen. Pure hydrogen. Nothing else. And if you take pure hydrogen and you do nothing to it, you just leave it alone, in 14 billion years, it will evolve into this. <laughs> Thank you. That is just how great this God of ours is. Isn't it incredible? This whole theory of evolution that is scientifically based has continued to progress forward to this point. Now, when I went home, back home to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, about, um, I don't know, a couple months ago or so, while I was in the area, I decided to stop by Nunda, South Dakota, and pay a visit to my cousin Ozzy. And when I arrived in town, I went to Lars's Tavern, which is where Ozzy usually hangs out. When I got there, Lars told me that Ozzy had found a job, which was a complete surprise not only to me, but the entire family, because it's the first time it's ever been done. <laughs> he said that he got a job with the County Highway Beautification Department. And I asked where I could find him. He said, well, if you go out County Line Road 121, just outside of town, you'll find him. So I drove out on County Line Road 121, and there was Cousin Ozzy with another guy. And I just sat there in my car, and I looked at him for a while. And something very strange was going on. Cousin Ozzy would dig a hole, move down about five feet, dig another hole, move down about five feet, dig another hole, so on and so forth. And the guy that he is working with followed behind, putting the dirt back in the same hole that Ozzy just emptied. And after about 10 minutes, I was confused, so I walked up and I greeted Cousin Ozzy, and I said, what exactly are the two of you doing? And Cousin Ozzy introduced me to his partner, and he said, usually we work in a team of three. But the third man who plants the trees was sick today. <laughs> uh, You know, Cousin Ozzy, if he wasn't real, would have to invent him. <laughs> you know, one of the questions that came up quite frequently last week in the questions and answers was, why don't we talk more about the Bible? And so for a moment this morning, we're going to focus on the Bible, the grand old book of the ages. It holds within it the wisdom, the direction, the advice to help us become more of what we are and to live a better life. Now, to a certain degree, the Bible has gotten a bad rap for two primary reasons. First of all, throughout the ages, the Bible has had political motivations inserted into it by men to take control or overpower women and men. It was a political thing. Whoever revised the Bible put their political viewpoints into it, and that's unfortunate. The second thing is that many of the stories in the Bible <clears throat> are supposed to be, or by a certain group of people, claimed to be the factual truth, that they're to be taken literally. And many of the stories are unbelievable. But the fact of the matter is, the Bible was never meant to, to be taken literally. That concept never, never surfaced until the late 1600s, 5,000 years after the Bible was written. It was always meant to be taken allegorically. And by allegorically, I mean the Bible was meant to be taken as stories that hold within them a very important moral or a lesson or something, a, a pearl of wisdom that we can glean from it and in doing so improve our lives, live happier lives, and become more fulfilled. It's an incredible source of inspiration and motivation. So when we read the stories of the Bible, we don't take them literally, but we read them as if we were reading a parable, at, at, like Jesus told. And within that, we look for the lesson. Now, as an example this morning, let's just take a look at the story, the first story in the Bible of Adam and Eve. It tells in the book of Genesis that God created the Garden of Eden. He created Adam and Eve. He put them in the Garden of Eden to be caretakers. And believe me, they had a cushy life. They had a good deal going. They'd wake up in the morning and look at the sunrise, the glorious sunrise in the blue sky. 
They'd lollygag around the path going through the garden all day, surrounded by plants and trees that had sumptuous, delicious fruits and vegetables on them that were organically grown and they weren't touched with pesticides and, and insecticides and, and all sorts of other preservatives. At night they'd sit back and they'd watch the sunset and the moon rise. They'd go to sleep and, and sleep soundly. They had no worries, they had no miseries, they had no fears. Everything was just a-okay. The only thing they couldn't do, they couldn't eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They didn't know why. God just says that's a no-no, don't do it. Everything else is yours. Don't eat the fruit from that tree. Well, one day Adam and Eve were walking through the Garden of Eden, and they came across a serpent standing by the tree of knowledge. And the serpent began to shellack them with temptation. The serpent said, you know, the only reason God doesn't want you to eat from this tree is because it has the best fruit in the whole garden. The only reason God doesn't want you to eat from this tree is because God knows the minute you taste that fruit, you become as smart as him, and he doesn't want that to happen. And it went on, and it went on, and it went on, until they decided to take a bite. And the minute they did, excuse the expression, the forbidden fruit turned into a big jam. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> it's one of those spur of the moment things that I didn't think through. <clears throat> anyway, in that moment, everything changed. Everything changed. The way they saw the world changed. The way they saw themselves changed. And the first thing that happened is they began to make distinctions which they never made before. And those distinctions led to, op, or to opinions. And the opinions led to attitudes, hardened attitudes. And the first distinction they made was between themselves. That noticed that they were different. And they took those differences to be wrong. So they ran off in different directions and they found something to cover themselves up. But also in that moment, shame came down on them like a cold, wet blanket. They were shameful of who they are and what they were. The second thing that happened is they felt guilt. We have done wrong. They considered themselves bad. And with that guilt came fear of God. And with the fear of God came a sense of separation from God. And they went and hid in the bushes because they didn't want God to find him. And the third thing that happened, with his guilt and with his shame, life became very, very difficult. It became hard labor. Now this is more than just a fairy tale. It's more than just a fable. For every single one of us here, at some point in time, have experienced the same thing that Adam and Eve supposedly experienced in the Garden of Eden. They call that the fall in the Bible. And it means the fall in consciousness. They fell from a state of blissful consciousness to a state of miserable consciousness. They set, fell from a state of total, unconditional self-acceptance to a state of self-rejection. They fell from a state of freedom and liberation and love for the self to a sense of shame. They fell from God as a friend to God as a foe. A fall in consciousness, paradise was lost. Now for each and every one of us, we came into this world and we're exactly in the same state of consciousness that Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden before the fall. We had things good. All we had to do was put forth the slightest whimper and we would get held, we would get fed, we would get a change of new clothes, whatever it took to make us happy. Adoring eyes looked at us every place we went. People would make funny looks and say coochie coochie goo in a funny voice. They begged to hold us. They begged for us to just give some sort of an indication that we recognized them with a smile or a burp. And they laughed and their hearts were warmed by it. In that state, we had no regrets of the past. We had no fears of the future. We didn't reflect on ourselves as bad. We had no sense of low self-esteem, no sense of unworthiness. Everything was grand. Our consciousness was at that high level of accepting life as it was.